talk is going to be focused on the, the recent updates we have on the VMAP open source package, uh, including uh, speed, uh, 4K, and we're adding a confidence interval uh, to the prediction. And uh, I'm going to st start by just uh, give you a brief background on the, uh, how we got here. Right, so VMAP actually started as a research project at Netflix with the intention that we, we have a vast video catalog and we cannot afford to do human inspection at every single piece of them. So there has to be a way to automate them. Uh, when we evaluate uh, the solutions in the market, we haven't been find one that uh, could fit our purpose. So we de decide to go with our own. And how we're going to approach this is that we're going to start with uh, research collaborations with universities. So the first collaborator we have is with U University of Southern California. Um, this actually starts in 2013. That's the time before I joined. So after work of a year, we start to have this VMAP, uh, actually the first version of VMAP running in production at Netflix. And we start to adding more collaborators uh, working on this project that includes in UT Austin and uh, University of Nantes from France. Um, both universities has an uh, expert. So UT Austin is with Professor Al Balvik and uh, University of Nantes is uh, Patrick Lecalet. They're both like expert in this video quality ac uh, assessment fields. Um, so moving forward, um, in 2015, we have our first public showing at ICIP which is through an industrial paper, very briefly mentioned about the VMAP. Um, in 2016, in June, we, we have this VMAP uh, published on GitHub, and we also have our first uh, VMAP tech blog. Uh, in 2017, we have a, a major upgrade of the VMAP version to 0.6.1. And in this version, we also add a phone model, which can make a more accurate prediction uh, when the viewing condition is on through a mobile device. Uh, in the middle of that year, we also got supported from uh, FFmpeg. So VMAP becomes something that's being supported uh, in this FFmpeg as a filter. Um, earlier this year, we have our dynamic optimizer published. Uh, this enabled in production, which is a uh, VMAP enabled video optimization framework. Uh, it's been running for encoding our content in our uh, cloud-based uh, uh, platform. And most recently, we have a new release of this uh, VMAP, including a number of features, uh, which is um, what I'm going to be talking today. So I'm going to be cover a few topics. Uh, what's new in this uh, new release? We have uh, speed optimization and include the 4K model. And also, we're trying to have a, a confidence interval prediction of uh, what uh, the VMAP prediction uh, gives you. In, in a sense, uh, we want to know uh, like how much uncertainty is in this prediction, how reliable it is, so that people can make uh, more informed decisions. And I'm also going to dive s slightly dabble into a number of um, upcoming uh, features, and we plan to roll out in this, in this open source package. So speed up. So we, ma we made this optimization uh, for this uh, um, VMAP uh, OSS executable and the uh, lib VMAP library. There's really nothing much to talk about, except that we add this uh, multi-threading feature uh, the, credit, uh, the credit has to go to this guy. Um, this is one of our open source uh, contributors. Um, so we have uh, enabled the multi-threading in our production, but uh, we haven't got to the time to uh, make it available in the open source package. Um, but um, so this Don Takila uh, jumped in to help us out. Um, and built on top of that, we we'll also add this uh, subsampling feature. So essentially, you can compute VMAP on every one, fra one frame of every a few n frames. And uh, by doing that, you actually could uh, uh, meet your expectation if you want to do real time. Uh, you can do this at expensive, some sacrificing of certain uh, accuracy. Basically, show this diagram if you're. Um, uh, enabling this subsampling uh, feature, 
uh, you're going to get a speed up. But there is also this diminishing return effects. Um, probably could be uh, more optimized through uh, making the uh, uh, software better. So uh, for the next part, I'm going to be talking about the 4K model. So here is just an overview of how the VMAP framework works. Right? So uh, essentially it has two parts. The first part is basically we're trying to extract some of the features you can see as elementary metrics, which will um, extract uh, using knowledge we have uh, about the human vision system. And we build those features. Uh, they will give predictions that's quality inducing. And in the second step, what we actually do is we collect the uh, training data from doing subjective tests, right? And through a machine learning based uh, regression model, we're going to be aligning those feature extraction we had with those subjective scores. And this is a typically a lab test that we do in order to collect the subjective score, uh, su subjective data. Right? This is our collaborator and university nonsense and friends. And you can see uh, here is a typical viewing conditions uh, a subject is under. So after viewing a video, they're supposed to vote using this absolute category rating, ACR scale, uh, to vote the video on the scale of from very bad to excellent quality. And what VMAF basically does is to, to believe that this is going to be a, lin uh, a scale that's linear with the human perception of quality. And we're basically going to be mapping them to a score of 0 to 100. And we do simple things. We, uh, for the excellent quality, we roughly map them to the score of 100. And for quality that's bad, it's a, it's about, uh, we map it to 20. So on the lower ends, we actually have some space so that we can map even lower quality, which is not being tested in the lab. And the assumption we make here for the, when we uh, test the 1080p model, which is the uh, version 0.6.1, is that um, so the viewer is sitting in front of the 1080 uh, on the display, uh, which is uh, 1080p TV. And uh, the video itself is going to be 1080p. And there is a height of this display. And we maintain a viewing distance of three times uh, the height of the display. And what this one gives you is a viewing angle of approximately 60 pixels per degree. And you might wonder where this, com uh, where this number coming from. So um, this 60 pixel per degree is the critical uh, viewing condition for a viewer to appreciate uh, the details in the content. Um, what we're drawing here is a contrast sensitivity map of the human vision system. So what essentially this one tells you is it, you can think of it as a frequency response of the human eye. So how the human responds to giving a stimuli stimuli of a certain frequency. Uh, you're, if you're going from a very low frequency to a very high uh, frequency, the response give you is different. Uh, what you can tell here is that if you go be be beyond 60 uh, cycles per degree, the human eye would not be able to appreciate uh, any of the details. So the response is zero. So there's a limit on how much you can perceive in terms of the frequency of the signal. And um, so if you're doing the math, uh, 60 cycles per degree corresponding to about 120 pixels per degree. And why we're picking this 60 pixels per degree is that it roughly matched to 20% uh, of this response. So a point here. So based on this formula, you can see that if you're viewing a 1080p video, the best uh, viewing distance is 3.2 times the height of the display. Uh, but we're just uh, using a rough approximation, which is about three times the height. So what we can really say here is the VMAP 1080p model is essentially a 60, 60 pixels per degree model. 
So now the question is, uh, can we just use the 60 uh, 1080p model to predict a 4K video? Because very naturally, you could tend to just applying this model if you have a 10, uh, 1080 uh, 4K video, right? Very simple. You just uh, um, this um, VMAC would take an image of any res a video of any resolution, no problem. Um, but so, but we need to understand what essentially it means, right? So, um, if you're doing the math, like according to this uh, geometry, uh, what it tells you is if you're applying this model to a uh, 4K video. It's like you're predicting the quality when the viewing this is 1.5 the height of the display, right? Because essentially, uh, you're trying to predict what if 60 pixels is packed into one degree, and this matches this exact uh, viewing condition. And the good news is this is all good because um, even if we were doing a testing for the 4K, 1.5 the height is ideal viewing distance in order to, for the viewer to appreciate uh, the details in the content. So this is the good part. On the other hand, um, if you're applying this model to a 4K video, there are certain things that hasn't been captured. One is the viewing angle, because now you're at 1.5 times the height, so you have a much wider viewing angle in this sense. So there's a matter of the fovea versus uh, peripheral uh, viewing condition, right? Because we know for the human eye, there is a very sharp imaging is only at very narrow uh, center uh, in the retina. And if you're going wider angles, uh, what you're going to be seeing is only blurred images. And if you're going wider, it's going to be more and more blurred. So if there is artifacts on your display um, that has Co um, sits at near to the sides of this uh, viewing angle, you're not going to be appreciate that. So there is this difference. Secondly, um, um, if you're applying a 1080p model to predict 4K, um, there is nothing we do to calibrate uh, the viewer's expectation of what they have uh, for a 4K viewing experience, right? We wouldn't be able to get this unless we go and try it out, like to ask the viewer to really to view uh, on the 4K display and 4K content. And that's what we do. So we're always doing testing. Um, subjective testing would be an important part of the training the VMAP. So, uh, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to be diving into how we actually do the uh, uh, do the training, uh, but you can find all the details in, on, on the open source page. Um, so here is the results. So if we compare uh, the 4K model that has been trained uh, using our 4K subjective data versus the 1080p model, and you can see this is the, uh, the corresponding relationship, the scatter plot you're going to be getting. Um, so it looks uh, pretty good because um, there is almost a very good correlation between those two models, which suggests that if you, uh, the 1080p model is actually not bad for predicting um, 4K quality. It also uh, proves that uh, the, the viewing distance versus the view, uh, display height is really the first order effects that's happening. Um, but we do see there are some discrepancies in the prediction score uh, here and here. Um, so those are should be content related. And also, uh, slope of this curve can be explained by the fact that, that in the test, we're actually trying to cover a wider quality range because now we're up to 4K. And on the lower ends, we're having very similar resolution. So if you want to cover this score within uh, uh, the quality range, using the score of 0 to 100, you kind of compress uh, the spectrum and end up with uh, uh, this uh, relationship, which is off the 45 degrees. So next topic I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the uncertainty involved in a, a VMAP model. 
So we go back to this VMAP fr framework again. And let's think about, like, uh, within this framework, uh, where possibly we could uh, in introduce uh, uh, uncertainty or variabilities. Um, the first place is here. So when we collect subjective data, um, we have many viewers, and we average a viewer score to use the MOS score to do the training, right? But even among the different viewers, there are disagreement. So the score is quantified by a confidence interval. The MOS score is quantified by a confidence interval. And the result that we use those score in the training process is that they're not going to be capturing um, the diversity of the opinion among different viewers. So this is uncertainty number one. The second uncertainty here is that uh, when we're doing this uh, machine learning-based uh, regression, right, we have uh, training data, but we don't know the population. So we have a sample, but we don't have the population. So this is very typical for any machine learning-based uh, uh, algorithm that there will be uh, this uncertainty involved uh, in its prediction power. And what we're trying to do here uh, in, in, in this new model is that we're essentially trying to capture the second part here. Um, so we're leaving uh, the first part of the uncertainty to future work. Um, the good news about uh, trying to estimate uncertainty is that uh, there is a pretty standard way in statistics that you can, we can borrow in order to estimate how much variability or uncertainty uh, there in a, a regression model. Right. This is called bootstrapping. Um, so putting simple terms, bootstrapping essentially means you're doing resampling with replacement. So if you have a set of samples, right, but you want to estimate how much impact this sample will not represent over all population, what you can do is to uh, resample from this uh, uh, data. But you can do this with replacement. That means each time you take some samples out, but you're also going to be put it back in for the second one. So you do this uh, uh, independent sampling. And this will give you, you can do this n times. Each time, you're going to be having one sample. And you take this sample to train your model. So if you do this n times, it will give you a um, distribution of prediction. right? And from this distribution, uh, you can get a pretty good idea of uh, how much variability in, in, in the prediction. There are actually two ways to do this. You can either do this on the, um, on the raw data, which is a training sample, or you could use the data to feed a model, and you can calculate how much residue is in there, and then you can apply this uh, bootstrapping model on the residue. And so for the first approach, basically, there's no underlying assumption about uh, this uh, uh, structure of the data. So you could, it's pretty, you can pretty universally apply that technique, but uh, the prediction the interval could be pretty wide. On the second approach though, uh, if you know there is underlying structure in the data, you could take advantage of that, right? They end up with uh, less uh, uncertainty in the prediction. So I'm gonna be showing you uh, here are some results, like, um, so let me explain. So on the left and on the right, each one is the one of the two approaches. And on the x-axis, I'm showing uh, the, the true score, which is the MOS data that we have collected um, through subjective testing. And on the y-axis, each center point here is a VMAP prediction. And this, uh, um, error bar plots, the upside and downside basically shows uh, the confidence interval 95%, which is three times the, the delta of that uh, prediction. So you can see um, there are a few trends, right? One trend is that uh, if you're moving down towards the lower ends of this uh, uh, quality score spectrum, the variation seems to be larger. And this can be explained by the fact that uh, in our subjective testing, uh, we actually have more data on the higher ends compared to the lower ends. So whenever you have a, a less training data, you end up with uh, more uncertainty. This is uh, completely natural. Um, 
And um, the second thing we can see is that if you look at the average number, um, if you're using the bootstrapping based on the residue, uh, the standard deviation can be actually less. So which is a good news. That means our modeling works, like applying this regression and uh, extracting the uh, residue actually help to reduce the uncertainty uh, that we predict about this model. And here is basically just another data set. Uh, the scale is a little bit uh, different because it's the DMOS, so that you got this uh, negatively correlated uh, plots. And the other message we got here is, so consider how much complexity you can uh, afford, right? If you can train a, like more, uh, if you afford to train more models, uh, increase the number n, you expect to have a more accurate prediction. And uh, what it turns out is that, uh, so this uh, prediction doesn't vary by too much. So, um, so in our model that we put into open source package, we actually choose a number 20, which is a fairly good one, a uh, good balance between the accuracy versus the complexity. For the VMAP model, so far we have been using pretty simple temporal features. Um, so among all the uh, special features, we have a very simple uh, temporal feature which basically calculates the frame difference, right? So you got uh, this kind of measure like how much a signal difference is there in average from frame to frame, but it does nothing more. Um, and in the new mod, uh, in, in upcoming models, what we plan to uh, incorporate is slightly more sophisticated model, but also in a region of affordable compu computational power. Um, so the idea is very simple. We take this uh, original frame difference signal, we apply some um, more complicated uh, temporal feature extraction based on that. And we use that to replace the current uh, uh, frame diff one. And um, we have results show that actually give you a better uh, prediction power. And um, so if you go to the link, there is actually, we have a um, um, research paper um, put onto archive if you're interested in this. Secondly, we're planning to extend the VMAF to cover HDR and WCG um, videos. Uh, the VMAP model we have applied so far only applied to SDR. And if you want to apply uh, for HDR um, and the WCG, we might need a, a new model. So what are the challenges? The challenges here is that uh, besides the video signals themselves, there we, we need to take into account um, other characteristics about the display because the displays has different characteristics which also affects how um, the, the viewer experience. Um, I'm plotting this, um, citing this plot from um, Adobe study. So basically they do uh, a study on what are the factors that would affect uh, the prediction accuracy of the human um, subject on the display. So, uh, some of the most dominant factors including uh, the maximum luminance uh, of the display and minimum luminance and followed by the uh, color gamma and bit depths. So in order to derive a more accurate model, uh, we need to select which are the most important features we want to include in this model so that um, we can tweak uh, the VMAP model um, also take into account this uh, input from the display device. Lastly, um, I want to mention about uh, one line of work that we do is to consider extending the current VMAP model into more quality of experience type of uh, prediction. So if you think about VMAP, it's really a short-term model because it's most accurately uh, for short videos a few seconds long. For much longer sequence, other effects start to kick, uh, kick in, including, for example, uh, there is a delayed and attenuated response for the frequency drop um, 
we did this study, and uh, this is one of the observations. And the other part would be um, how you would want to consider whenever there's a rebuffering in your streaming, right? It certainly damages your viewer experience, but by how much? And how would you fold those considerations uh, into uh, the prediction of the overall quality of experience? And uh, the work is to build on top of the VMAP by incorporating uh, more longer term considerations. And also this is driven by subjective studies that we have conducted. Well, I mean, where the VMAP model shouldn't be tied to any one of those metrics. It's just like uh, VMAP or uh, SDR, it's not to any of the codecs, right? So we trim one model, uh, hopefully can apply to any of the compression standards. So it's not an issue for us. Well, so VMAP covers that scenario because um, in the correct uh, use case, um, so you should be aligning the reference video and the distorted video in the same resolution. So if you're starting with a high resolution source video and you compress it before, sorry, you compress it after you, you uh, downsample it. So in the correct way of doing the VMAP calculation, you should be upscaling it to the original source. Well, actually, so two I understand is that uh, uh, the VMAP is, not as sensitive to what kind of upscaling algorithm that you have been using, as long as you're not using like bilinear. Bilinear might be a little bit uh, too coarse. Um, I would suggest like using like bicubical seems to be pretty reasonable one. Well, um, so actually not. So the scheme that we have in mind is something that do as, to start with, something as simple as doing, taking the difference of between two adjacent frames and build on top of that. So doing a motion search might be too expensive and uh, we also did some tests in the past. It doesn't seem to be helped by much. So the, the, the human um, measurement is just to do the last step align, alignment with a subjective score. But when we do the elementary feature extraction, those uh, features itself is capturing those uh, uh, like human vision system feature um, characteristics like all those contrast sensitive function and has been uh, modeled in those features. Thank you.